This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now, your host, Bronson James. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Armor of God telecast. I'm pleased that you've tuned in today. I believe I have a word for you that may help you in your Christian walk. If you have not become a follower of Jesus Christ and you're caught up in the conundrum of should you or should you not, perhaps today's program will assist you in making a decision. If you're already working with the Master and walking with the Master, I would encourage you then to consider strengthening your connection with God in today's program. I want to talk to you about a subject that is synonymous with the Christian way of life and any other religion that has the discipline of something called prayer. Prayer is an old English word that sometimes sets us off, but if we just said talking, or asking, or beseeching, or communicating, those words would be acceptable in the 21st century. But prayer uh, kind of causes us to become paralytic and restricted in our communication with the divine being. But today's program is designed to help you with it. First of all, our Master, our Savior Jesus Christ, in Matthew the sixth chapter, began teaching on the subject of prayer by giving what is called the model prayer. It's called, generally, the Lord's Prayer. Let me just read a portion of it to whet your appetite. He says, after this manner, that is, this example I'm giving you, this outline that I'm giving you, shall be your template for forming prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray you, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is on earth, as it is in heaven. This is essentially how this prayer starts out. Now, I was reading in the King James language, which is Elizabethan English, from a distant century, if you will. But it reminds me of a sermon I gave many years ago. It was probably the most pedantic scripture or sermon I have ever given. I mean, I had the scriptures galore on every place in the Bible where the word prayer was used. And I went through painstakingly, didactically, these are just fancy terms for meaning professorial or teaching. And afterwards, I was evaluated by a gentleman who said, well, it was technically sound, it just didn't connect to the people. I want to connect with you today on this issue of prayer and not be pedantic and not be uh, shall we say, impressive with the study and the presentation on a subject that many of us assume we know about. So, let me first remind you of the material that we're going to offer you in today's program. And this is going to be beneficial to you because the first offer that we have is a sermon tape by Bill Watson entitled, Communicate Always to God. Communicate always to God, and prayer is a means, a means by which we can communicate with Him. And also the booklet, How to Be an Overcomer, that is, one who has risen above their personal circumstances and situations and the sins that bog a life down, but how to be an overcomer included in that will be other instructions that will be helpful to you to make your understanding clearer about the prayer life that you should enjoy in your walk with the Master. How to be an overcomer. Communicate always with God. Both can be yours toll free when you dial one 578 8791 Or you can visit our website at www.cgi.org. Operators are waiting now to take your calls. And everything, of course, is absolutely free of charge. As we continue with this subject, Jesus Christ said, and I won't turn to the scripture now, but in Luke, the 
18th chapter, he says, men ought to always, men being generic term for all human beings, should always pray and not to faint. Pray. I remember my study of the Old English or Elizabethan English in the form of William Shakespeare. And many times speeches would be put in the mouths of different individuals and uh, they would say things like, I pray thee. They were asking a favor or asking an opinion or asking some accommodation from an individual. And so they would use the old English term, pray. I pray thee, I ask thee, I beseech ye thee. And this is an old English term that I think if we understood its use when it comes to the language of modern times will probably free us up to know that we should ask of God, we should communicate with God, we should be connected with Him through our lips, through our minds, through our consideration of who He is, where we may be, and how He can elevate us from the difficult circumstance we may find ourselves in. Because we all experience them experience these things, don't we? We all have financial issues, especially in the times in which we live. Perhaps we have family concerns, marital concerns, emotional concerns, psychological concerns, as well as spiritual concerns. And how do you rise above those situations that surround you all the time in this life? Well, Jesus Christ takes a moment to suggest there is an, an outline to prayer. There are several elements within this outline of prayer, but there are three that I want to emphasize for you today. Number one, there is praise. Take a look at our text. I read for you the opening lines of what is called the Lord's Prayer. He says, say when you pray, our Father which art in heaven, you are designating his location where he resides, that is the Father. Remember, Jesus Christ came to represent the Father and to declare Him unto all humanity. So He establishes that Father is located in heaven. You later learn in the Bible, especially in Paul's writings, that there are three heavens. That's not my subject today, so I will pass by that, maybe touch on it in another program. But because we have established the location, we then say, Hallowed, glorified be your name hallowed be your name. Well, what is God's name? It's not God, that's a title. What is his name? We argue about those things, whether it should be pronounced Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh, uh, all kinds of suggestions out there about the pronunciation. But Jesus simply says, say our Father. I don't ever recall calling my Father by his name. Only when I introduced him to someone else or made reference to him in another setting, but always it was dad or father, or in the Greek language, Abba, Abba, father. So we can establish this glorification, this praise of God, because his name, Yahweh, Jehovah, means something. It means salvation, right? In the name of God is this notion that he can save us. Even in Jesus' name is the notion of salvation. Yahweh, the ever-living one, the eternal one. You are establishing the fact that there is someone beyond your circumstances who has power to enter your situation and make all the difference through prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then it says something quite interesting. It says, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Does God have a kingdom? Well, Jesus Christ said he came to represent that kingdom. In fact, as he started out on his ministry, remember what he said? He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So acknowledging to God in prayer this first point of praise is to indicate to him that you acknowledge that there is a kingdom beyond this world. There is a kingdom of greater power, greater force, and greater construct to alter the way we are living and the path that we have chosen to go. Thy kingdom come. Then it says, thy will be done. Where is that will to be done? On earth 
as it is in heaven. Well, in heaven, there are angels. There's Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. There are 24 elders. There are uh, innumerable hosts of angels who do God's will, who do his bidding. God's will is done in heaven. So on earth we are saying and proclaiming, let thy will be done on earth. That's a form of praise to God indicating that God's ways are perfect and right and just and holy. All of those attributes that we may find lacking or wanting in the society around us. So the first notion of praising God in prayer is a good formula to recognize, to praise Him for His greatness, His glory. You could go on in a prayer to talk about, I looked at a rose today, Lord. I saw the thorns on the stem, and that is not an attractive feature. But the rose itself, and all the different varieties that exist out there, just to praise God for his creation. Perhaps you have a pet, an animal, dog, cat, whatever it might be, and you've noticed the attributes of this particular animal that serves as a friend to you. Would it be out of line to thank God for the creation of an animal like this, a dog or cat, Whatever the animal might be for you, I hope it's not one of those exotic animals that wind up in the news for doing something horrible to another human being or to a human being. But you understand, you can give praise to God for something so simple. I remember a gentleman who was a minister singing with a, a particular choir years ago described the story of going to his mother's home and how they went through the house praising God for all that was in the house. That was an amazing story to contemplate, to imagine in my mind how thankful a person could be and how praiseworthy God is for making provision for you and me. So that first point of praising God is very, very necessary. But the second point is as important. It is called confession. And this point is taken up in verse 12 of Matthew 6. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. One translation says, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, who go against us, who step out of line, who step over the line into our territory, if you will. But by forgiving such a person, we then can expect forgiveness. But notice the confession that we are debtors, that we are trespasses. Forgive us. And you then can be very specific with God in prayer to ask him to forgive you for the bad attitude you had towards your wife or towards your husband or even towards your children. Perhaps you had cross words on the job with a co-worker, maybe even with your boss. That would not be advisable because they do have the last word on whether you stay on the job or not. But if you have crossed the line, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go before God and confess your fault to God? In addition, Jesus said in another occasion that you cannot come before God unless you repent or make a confession to the person you may have wronged in order for your prayer to be heard. So you must consider that in the model prayer if you're going to be asking God to forgive you of some infraction you have committed against another human being, you should go to that human being first and then come to God with your confession. And the Bible says that he is faithful to hear it. Confession, what a thought. And then it says, in giving the third part of this idea of prayer, thanksgiving. Wow, what a powerful word, thanksgiving. We, as a nation here in the United States of America, have a day we call thanksgiving, came into existence when Abraham Lincoln decided there should be a day of prayer and fasting, of thanksgiving to God, and it has continued as a tradition all the way to this present day in our society. And other nations have thanksgiving days as well. But in the notion of giving thanks to God, think about, and notice that little segue, think will lead to thanks. When you think about the goodness of God, when you think about the air you breathe, yes, it may be polluted, 
but generally this air is a provision of God. When you think about the food and the tastes that have been placed in the food and the nutrients that have been placed in the food, you can give God thanks. When you think about the home you live in and the car you drive and that somehow God has sustained you through a downturn in the economy so significant that the whole world is smitten with it and yet you still have a place to sleep, clothes to wear, a car to drive, people to love you. Isn't it appropriate then to give God thanks? Notice how he puts it. He says, and lead us not into t temptation, but deliver us from the evil, or the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I have to say to you, as I look back on my life and think about the goodness of God, I remember stepping on a piece of glass when I was probably about seven or eight years old. Now, you have to understand, Mama had told me not to go outside without my shoes on. But you know, Mama wasn't home. I decided to go out and run out in the streets, and sure enough, stepped on a big piece of glass, almost cut my big toe off. Hmm, that's rough. Never told her. I put my sock and shoe on. It was ble a bloody mess. But somehow, God had grace and mercy on a little boy who had been disobedient to his parent. Now, when I look back on that and think about it, I can't help but thank God for his intervention because it could have been infected, it could have become gangrenous, it could have been a number of things that would have afforded me the loss of a toe. But God was good to me as a child. And as I have grown through my adult years, I look back on situations and circumstance that I can refer to God or reference to God as terms of thanksgiving for his goodness to me. In this world that is called an evil world by the Bible, when the enemy is out and about attacking people of belief and persuasion, I can look back and see how he stepped into my life. What about you? Are there things that when you look back and consider you say, well, I should have been dead. I should have been paralyzed. I should have been hurt in some kind of way, and yet God has intervened with me. Or even if you have suffered a dis disability of some kind, yet God has kept you alive. He's given you energy and vivation and a testimony to determine that you have value to him. These three areas of prayer, praise, confession, and thanksgiving can be examined and considered in this model prayer. But there are other places in the Bible that indicate God's answering of prayers in dire circumstances. Perhaps you are a viewer today who is set about with all kinds of difficulty, all kinds of challenges, and you don't know how you're going to get out of it and how are you going to overcome it. Well, take a look at the example in the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, if you will, in the book of Daniel. Daniel was a prophet of God. His name Daniel means judged of God, or God is the judge. And it's so interesting because there was a decree that went out. Now, I, I know I'm going to get all up into your situation and the situation of the society around us, where the issue of prayer in schools, for instance, is a sore point with a lot of folk. I would imagine if I was still in school today, and I'm just imagining it, if I had a major test to take, I think I might pray anyhow, though despite what the law may be or despite how somebody else would look at it. Well, Daniel was in a community or society where the king Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian were in charge, but in the case of Daniel 6, Daniel the 6th chapter, it says that there was a decree and a plot by individuals who were against Daniel to inhibit him or limit his prayer life. Daniel was known as a praying man. Daniel went all the way back to the Babylonian community when Nebuchadnezzar came in and captured the Judaites, took them into captivity along with his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, you know, formerly known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, he was taken into captivity, but he was given freedom in the society in which he lived. And when the Babylonians were overthrown, that's 
Belshazzar was the king, and his kingdom of the Babylonians were, was overthrown by the Medes and the Persian, or the Medo Persian Empire. Well, he became friends. Daniel became friends with Darius the Mede. Look at verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first. Daniel was elevated to this lofty position. Well, he had his haters. Haters, you know, hater aid in the building because they didn't like the fact that this Jew was given such a prominent position. Verse 3, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king fought to set him over the whole realm. Daniel had risen to this lofty position. Well, here was the conspiracy. It's a very important conspiracy. They passed a ruling or wrote a law, presented it to the king, that he should establish that no one should pray in the kingdom. Look at what they suggested, verse 7. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the consulars, and the captains had consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition, ask a petition, another way of saying praying, or I pray thee, I beseech thee, any man who would ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save unto the king, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Wow. You mean there would be a nation that could pass a law that would prohibit the connectedness with God, any other God, it says, or any king, except for you, O king, for 30 days. It was a temporary law, 30 days. And if anybody violates this, they would be thrown into a den of lions. Well, how would you respond? Right now, in our society, as we do this program, we know the economic downturn of the nation. We not only know the economic downturn of the nation, but all over the world, there are conditions that confront the stability of the world in which we live. Are you praying about that? Your own circumstance, are you praying about it? Or do you take the approach, well, I don't know if prayer would be the appropriate thing to do. After all, if I'm a student in college and can't pay my college bill, uh, that's not looked on too favorably in our society. There are people speaking out against the Christian religion. There are people who confront Christianity in such a way as to inhibit its progress. Well, what happened to Daniel as a result of this situation? Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows were being opened to the chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. No change in Daniel. Daniel was willing to suffer the consequences of going against the society, going against the conspiracy, going against the na national trend to not be prayerful or connected to God. Friends, you and I know that the United States of America from where this program emanates, says that it is a God-fearing society. It says, by printing on its money, in God we trust. Well, pray tell you, tell me, pray tell me, I beseech you, tell me when we will start to pray as a people, earnestly. Well, here is what happened with Daniel. You know he was thrown into the lion's den. And it's so interesting as it's worded here, Verse 22, it says, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me for as much as before him in innocence was found in me and also before you, O king, have I done no hurt. The king was curious. He was hopeful that nothing would happen to Daniel, that Daniel would survive this breaking of the decree of prayer. And sure enough, when he went to solicit as to Daniel's well-being, he discovered, as Daniel told him, that an angel was dispatched from Almighty God to intervene on his behalf. My friends, do you have an expectation that Almighty God can intervene in your circumstances, whether it's healing, whether it's finances, 
whether it's relationships, whether it's your connectedness to God and the body of believers called the church. You can step out on faith in prayer by simply following those three steps, getting the material that we've offered to you today on the importance of prayer in your life, the communication with God, as well as being an overcomer through prayer. Won't you make that phone call toll-free to one 578 8791 I wish that you would now stay tuned and listen to my colleague as he brings to you more information that will entice you, hopefully, inducing you to bring your attention to this matter. Talking with God, discussing with God, communicating to God. It's all about, my friends, connecting up with God. And that's what Mr. James was frankly talking about today. It's important to have a connection with God. And prayer is designed about developing that kind of connection, a relationship with God. You see, prayer is very beneficial. For example, prayer leads to dependence on God, which leads to the development of trust and patience, and that connects up with validation, which builds faith, and that's pleasing to God. It's all about prayer serving to develop this relationship with God so that it becomes a mutual beneficial exercise. Now you may be saying, well, how can my prayers benefit God? I mean, God doesn't need my prayers. If anything, I need help from God and that's why I'm praying. But no, no, my friends, God is also benefited by your prayers because He too is encouraged over the fact that He sees you praying because prayer is an act of faith. And your Bible is very clear on this point, that if you want to please God, you have to have faith. Let us help you to better understand this relationship of connecting up with God. Dial now 888-578-8791 and ask for both of the free items that we're offering on today's program. A one-hour CD titled Communicate Always with God and a small little booklet easily readable in one single setting titled How to Be an Overcomer. Both of these, again, let me emphasize, are free for the asking. All you've got to do is dial the 888 number 578-8791 and ask the operator for both of these free offers. And while you're at it, hit that website at www.cgi.org and take a little bit of time to peruse through the website to see what else you may find of interest. Friends, this is Bill Watson, and as we always do, reminding all of you to keep on that armor of God so that you may be able to stand in this evil day. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at Post Office Box 2525, Tyler, Texas 75710. Call toll free at 1 888 578 8791 or call 1903 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at cgi.org or email us at armorofgod at cgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.